Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Just before we start, if anyone has any uh, technical problems, please let me know through the chat. There will be time for questions after the presentation, but uh, please feel free to type your questions in during the talk via the question field. And I shall then pause these on one the, once the presentation is finished. Unfortunately, Michelle, our um, manager, is not uh, available tonight, so that leaves me with the honor to introduce our speakers. Um, this is uh, Carlo Marcelis, who is a, a clinical geneticist in the Radboud UMC in Nijmegen. He is both a clinician and a researcher, and has been involved in research on the genetics of uh, anorectal malformations and factorial associations for almost 15 years. And then we have uh, Heiko Reuter, who is the head of the neonatology and pediatric intensive care at the University Hospital of Erlangen. Um, he's also a human geneticist with a special interest in the genetics of congenital malformations. Um, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, present us at this uh, interesting webinar. Um, it's the second time I, I've been invited in uh, in two years, I guess. So I hope it uh, it works well. I have no conflict of interest. Uh, so that as a disclaimer, and this uh, the aim of my talk is uh, to give a review on our genetic uh, our knowledge on the genetic etiology of ARM and to provide a guideline for history, uh, clinical and genetic studies in ARM patients and their family. This is mostly based on our recent uh, review that has been published last year uh, in the European Journal of Pediatric Surgery. Okay. Um, for me, it doesn't work quite well at the moment. Yeah, this seems better, yeah. Um, many patients have an isolated anorectal malformation, uh, uh, but additional anomalies are found in about half of the patients. These uh, additional abnormalities are important to recognize because they can have consequences in choosing the line of treatment, uh, but they could also point to specific syndromic causes of ARM. For this, it's important to look at the complete patient. Like in this cartoon, it's difficult to recognize an elephant when you are just looking at its tail or at its ears. But if you look at the complete picture, you might recognize it's an elephant. And that's the same for many of the syndromes. Um, the first group of syndromic ARM I would like to have a look at is chromosomal anomalies. Uh, chromosomal anomalies are present in approximately 10% of ARM patients, and we have reviewed them already about 10 years ago. Uh, but for most of these chromosomal anomalies, an ARM is only present in, the, in a minority of the patients. But still, these chromosomal anomalies, they could lead us to uh, knowledge on the location of genes that might be involved in anorectal malformation. Uh, in specific types. I'd like to focus on three syndromes, three chromosomal syndromes that are more uh, often present. Oh, I think you have not, yeah, I was talking about this slide. I'd like to present uh, uh, a couple of syndromes uh, we see quite often in patients with anorectal malformation. Um, Down syndrome is the most common chromosomal abnormalities in, uh, in humans. And an ARM is found in approximately, approximately two to 5% of all patients with Down syndrome. In these patients, we specifically see an anal atresia without a fistula or a covered anus. And this type of uh, anomaly is found in 95% of the patients with Down syndrome. Uh, but this type of uh, anorectal malformation is rare in other uh, patients with anorectal malformation. So this might point to a specific uh, genetic uh, uh, involvement for a gene on chromosome 21 uh, in, in, in anorectal malformation. The second most common, uh, common chromosomal anomaly in ARM patients is the 13Q deletion syndrome. 
these patients typically have a combination of anorectal malformation with uh, urogenital abnormalities, especially a penoscrotal transposition or hyperspadias. Um, again, we've been looking at genes in this area, but I'm not going to into detail uh, for, for a specific gene has not been identified yet. The chromosomal anomaly with the highest incidence of ARM uh, in, uh, in humans is the cat eye syndrome. And this syndrome shows a, a classical combination of ocular colobomas, giving the impression of a cat eye, uh, together with uh, anoatresia, sometimes mild to moderate developmental delay and other uh, congenital abnormalities. And this is caused by a triplication of the proximal part of chromosome 20, uh, 22 usually in the form of a supernumerary marker as you can see in this old-fashioned fish slides you see two normal chromosomes 22 and an extra marker chromosome uh, which contains the material uh, that causes this cat eye syndrome okay A second group of uh, syndromic ARM uh, are the monogenic syndromes. And with monogenic, we mean that these syndromes are caused by mutations in single genes. And there are many monogenic syndromes caused by, by these type of mutations that hold ARM as a feature. Uh, a search in Phenomizer, that's a, a tool we can use to look for uh, symptoms and combine them with uh, genetic syndromes uh, using human phenotype ontology search terms and that revealed more than 90 syndromes that holds uh, an ARM as one of its features. In most of these features, ARM is found in only a minority of the cases and the usual, usually the diagnosis is made by other typical features but there are some uh, syndromes where ARM are one of the major uh, uh, symptoms, major signs. One of these is the Towns-Brock syndrome, and that's probably the most common monogenic syndrome in patients with an anorectal malformation. And uh, it has an autosomal dominant uh, inheritance pattern. It's called, uh, caused by mutations in the cell one gene. And in these patients, you often also see abnormalities of the hands, specifically the triphalangeal thumb. Uh, I don't know if you see my uh, pointer or an aplastic uh, thumb. And these patients also often have ear anomalies. This could be uh, microtia, so small ears or preauricular tags. Uh, but they also often have hearing loss. In addition, they can have renal anomalies. Looking at families with this uh, syndrome, we see uh, that this syndrome can be highly variable. And ARM is present in over 80% of the patients with Towns Brock syndrome. Uh, but some family members may only have hand or ear abnormalities without a recognized anorectal malformation. So if you see this in a patient, uh, it's also important to look at its family members. Okay. A second autosomal dominant uh, syndrome uh, with also a highly, vari uh, highly variable presentation is the Curahino syndrome. Classically, these patients have the triad of anorectal malformation, sacral anomalies, and the presacral mass. And this syndrome may not have been recognized in family members as they may have only minimal abnormalities. In some family members, the only symptom might be chronic constipation or a sacral anomaly that may well have gone unnoticed if it doesn't give any complaints. And occasionally, we can also see family members carrying the mutation that do not have any symptoms at all. This is a family I've seen uh, uh, myself years ago when I was still a trainee and uh, we saw then this family when uh, this girl was born with a complete triad of Curarino syndrome 
And at that time, no other family members were known to have abnormalities uh, fitting uh, Curarino syndrome. Uh, we were not able to study the family directly because the mother was also already pregnant from from the second child. Uh, and but we counted her as likely a de novo mutation, so likely there's no uh, increased risk of uh, a child with the same syndrome. Unluckily, the second child also had uh, partial sacral agenesis, uh, and the mother was found to have the same. Uh, and after that, we, we found the same in her sister and uh, a, another uh, child of this sister. And this family really shows uh, the high variation and always reminds me that we have to keep looking and not be too quick with uh, telling families it's a de novo uh, with, li uh, with uh, a small chance of recurrence. I do not have enough time in this presentation to uh, present many of the other monogenic syndromes. If you want to have a look at them, uh, uh, some of them are reviewed in our uh, paper from, uh, from last year. Uh, but I would like to switch to another very important uh, differential diagnosis in patients with anorectal malformation, the VACTO association. This holds the classical combination of vertebral anomalies, anorectal malformation, cardiac anomalies, uh, esophageal anomalies and renal uh, uh, dysplasia and limb abnormalities. And uh, usually this diagnosis is made when at least three uh, of the component features are present. Uh, this is the view of a uh, clinical geneticist that was uh, sampled by uh, um, Ben Solomon from the States. Uh, and the, they concluded that at least three vector component features should be present. Many uh, clinicians think that uh, either ARM or a tracheal uh, or esophageal atresia should be one of these uh, component features before uh, making this diagnosis. Now I'd like to switch um, to the guidelines we uh, provided for studying a patient with ARM after birth. And the first thing you have to look for is the clinical history, of course. And, uh, and in this, the prenatal history is uh, often important because usually this diagnosis is made directly at birth. Uh, the mode of conception is important uh, because we see that ARM seems to be more uh, frequent, more common after assisted reproduction. Uh, maternal illnesses, especially diabetes, but also the use of medication, can also increase the risk of anorectal malformation. Uh, so it's important to ask for these uh, abnormalities. And what I always would like to know if uh, any prenatal studies were done, uh, were ultrasound studies performed, and if so, were there any additional anomalies? Uh, was prenatal growth documented? Because growth retardation could point to different syndromic causes. A polyhydramnios noted during the pregnancy or at birth might be an indication of esophageal atresia in Vactel patients, while uh, oligohydramnios can uh, be indicative of a renal or genital urinary uh, anomaly. So it's important to know this when you see a patient with an anorectal malformation. Except for looking at the clinical history of the patient, it's also very important to look at the uh, family history. Uh, what we advise is to uh, take at least a three-generation family history. So that means uh, looking at siblings, the parents, uh, siblings of the parents and the grandparents. But maybe you can also ask for other family members. And uh, what you would like to know is, are there any other family members known to have an ARM? And in this respect, it's also important to ask for chronic constipation, uh, which could uh, be a symptom in unrecognized ARM. Um, it's also important to inquire for other uh, congenital abnormalities. This could be major, but also minor, like digi digital changes or external ear abnormalities or hearing loss, like we see in patients with Towns-Brock syndrome. 
if there is developmental delay or intellectual uh, disability in the family uh, that could be seen in families with different monogenic syndromes but also in all types of chromosomal anomalies like 20q11 deletion syndrome uh, that is also seen in patients with an anorectal malformation now switching to the clinical studies uh, at birth, first clinical investigations should be aimed at the right classification of the type of ARM and the investigation for other major anomalies that might influence the general prognosis of a patient and might influence the choice of treatments. Severe cardiac abnormalities might make the surgeon think twice before operating uh, an anorectal malformation. After the first surgical treatment, a second assess uh, assessment for associated anomalies should be performed because that could give signs to point to specific syndromes. Uh, for this, you could look at dysmorphic, uh, dysmorphology signs. So look at the face, what's the position of the eyes, what's the position of the ears and the form of the ears. Are there abnormalities of the nose or other, uh, other uh, facial signs that might give a clue to uh, a syndrome diagnosis. Imaging of the spine and the spinal cord is uh, uh, important, both because uh, spinal cord abnormalities are more often seen uh, in patients with anorectal malform malformation, but also because vertebral abnormalities are common. Limp abnormalities, like the thumb abnormalities I would, that was shown in towns brock syndrome, but also in other uh, syndromes with anorectal malformations like Factel can be common, and also general genital an anomalies uh, need to be looked at. Uh, hearing loss is often checked, at least in the Netherlands, in the first week of life. Uh, I don't know if it's the same in all uh, countries, but also that is important to look for. And what we also think is important to uh, follow a patient, not just do studies uh, directly after birth, but also follow the development of the patients. Because in many syndromes, developmental uh, problems only occur uh, at a later age. Uh, so if a patient has a, has a normal psychomotor development, you're unable to know that at the age of uh, two days. Uh, Uh, in our paper, we have tried to put this in, a, in an algorithm. Um, I've put this in this presentation, uh, but I don't think it's very easy to see that uh, in, in web view. So I'll only uh, show it. If you run, want to see it in more detail, please go and have a look at our paper. Um, it's also important to look at family members. Uh, especially if the clinical evaluation of the index patients or the family history uh, might give clues uh, towards uh, a familiar or syndromic uh, cause. A look at the, the face or the hands of the parents could reveal subtle features of monogenic syndromes such as Towns Brock syndromes. And that's very, very easy that you don't need a dysmorphologist to do that. Um, when there is a suggested family history, uh, we suggest to do more extensive uh, studies. And then this includes a perineal uh, inspection, especially in patients with chronic uh, constipation. And it also includes uh, dysmorpholo dysmorphological investigation, usually by a trained dysmorphologist. Um, ultrasound investigations of the uh, genital urinary tract uh, could be uh, performed and also x-ray or MRI uh, studies of the spine uh, could show cryptic malformation or vertebral or sacral defects that uh, might be important in these patients. Now to switch to genetic studies. Currently, we don't think there is a clear place for routine genetic studies in patients with an isolated ARM and without a suspicious family history. We think that genetic studies should be reserved for those patients who have additional anomalies or a family history consistent with syndromic ARM. When there is a clear suspicion of a specific syndrome, 
uh, targeted testing for that syn syndrome should be performed. That could be uh, a single gene testing, it could be a karyotype, if you think of, da of Down syndrome or other chromosomal syndromes. When there's no clear suspicion of a specific syndrome, uh, we suggest do a broad analysis to look for copy number variations, so that, that means duplications or deletions of chromosomes, but also for uh, point mutations. And we suggest to use whole exome sequencing uh, of the patients and both parents as a trio analysis as a first step because this te technique has the highest yields. I know in the Netherlands we are very, uh, we, we have many opportunities because this is financed by our insurance companies and that's probably not the same in most other uh, countries, but if it's possible, uh, that's the study we would choose. Okay. Now, finally, in the last two slides, I would like to first focus on the genetic counseling issues. The prevalence of uh, inorectal malformations in the general uh, population is estimated to be about one in 3,000. Uh, the occurrence of ARM in family members of ARM patients ranges between 0.5 and 0.8% uh, in different studies. And uh, this depends on taking into account only first degree or second degree or even third degree family members. Uh, and this could lead to a 15 to more than 200 fold uh, increase in uh, occurrence in family members. Um, the recurrence risk for offspring of ARM patients has rarely been studied. And the only study presenting results was performed in the, the German network on uh, urogenital and ARM, so the CURE network. And this small study showed a 62% uh, recurrence risk. In this study, eight adult isolated ARM patients got 16 children, of, and 10 of them had an anorectal malformation. And if this holds true in other populations, this really provides a lead, a lead for an autosomal uh, dominant inheritance in at least a subset of patients. But we think that the results should be taken with caution because of the low number of patients and also the possibility of selection bias. Maybe uh, patients who have a, a family history are more inclined to react uh, to this type of studies. Um, when a clear genetic diagnosis of syndromic anorectal malformation is made in a patient, this usually provides adequate information on the recurrence risks in the family. In sporadic patients with isolated ARM, and also in patients with associate and associated anomalies without a clear syndromic or genetic diagnosis, the estimation of the recurrence risk is more difficult. What we usually use for the family, for the healthy parents of a child with an ARM, uh, a sporadic ARM, we usually counsel a recurrence risk of about one to two percent. And this is the same in offspring of patients with an ARM, in our uh, view. However, in the latter, uh, for the offspring, we might have missed autosomal dominant inheritance of ARM especially because many patients uh, born with an ARM did not get children because they also often have fertility problems. Um, improved surgical techniques that maintain sexual functions, uh, function in a higher amount of ARM patients might lead to more cases with autosomal dominant inheritance in the future. So this really needs further studies before we can really provide uh, uh, good numbers for the recurrence risk in, uh, in children of patients. Okay, this was my last slide, except that I would like uh, to thank uh, my co-workers uh, in Nijmegen, but also the groups in Rotterdam, Bonn, Milan and Cincinnati who have uh, uh, worked with us in studying patients with ARM and Vactel uh, malformation. And um, I think I've got this one twice. Oh. If you have any questions, please, uh, you can uh, ask them uh, in the chat and uh, we'll come back to them after the talk of my colleague. Yes, thank you, Mark. Uh, Carlo, we'll uh, go to 
uh, Heiko now. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I hope you can see me. Okay, yes, thank you very Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk today about the um, genetics that we have tried to do in the um, in rectal malformations over the past 12, 13 years. Um, I have, wait a second. So, I have no conflict of interest. And um, I hear you, first of all, you see a drawing that is um, in the SOMA brochure. That's the um, support group in Germany. And it helps um, parents and very often also physicians to understand uh, the different forms of anorectal malformations. And um, so when we started with um, our genetic research, we were questioning ourselves, is there really uh, genetics in anorectal malformations and what kind of genetics? And the existing evidence um, very early already provided came um, from mouse or murin models. Here you see um, knockdown of cell four or cell one is the other uh, gene that Carlo already mentioned. And you see here an anorectal malformation in the mouse. And also in human, previously reported here by Albert Ginsel um, from uh, Zurich, um, already in 1984, he showed a family tree with uh, many affected individuals with ALA3 shots. So um, there was epidemiological evidence before we started our work, and there were animal models that um, indicated that genetics might uh, contribute to the expression of human anorectal malformations. So if, um, when we started this work, there was just about the beginning of the array-based molecular karyotyping. There was no exome sequencing yet available in 2009, at least not in Bonn where we started. And it only just begun. And um, but we already knew from the beginning that if we want to identify genetic causes, we systematically have to apply every technique that is there to um, basically identify the different causes um, that probably underlie anorectal malformations. So there are monogenic causes with high penetrance, and there are probably multifactorial causes with um, less genetic impact, but um, with a genetic predisposition that interacts with environmental factors and yield um, smaller recurrence risk and is probably the underlying cause in the majority of isolated cases. And we knew that if we find something um, that we will have to show in vertebrate animal models, our findings will be have, we have to basically uh, provide um, evidence that what we find is actually involved. And it's not just a um, 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 finding by chance. So um, if you look at people with anorectal malformations, um, in most families, uh, there would all, there will only be one affected person, and the defect, however, reoccurs and has been reoccurring over the past thousand years. And so we were thinking that a defect that goes along with a severe disability um, that was lethal before um, surgery was possible in the first forty eight hours of life and that also interferes with um, fecundity that a certain amount of de novo events might underlie these patients. And the experience in medical genetics would say that such mutational de novo events 
might comprise alterations of different size. So point mutations, very small changes, or very large changes, um, like a trisomy 21 or a 13Q deletion that Carla just um, reported on. So um, we thought it might be best to systematically apply array-based, uh, SNP array-based um, molecular carrier typing to our cohorts and see if we can identify gain or loss of genetic material in which patients differ from healthy controls. And um, if the patients differ, we would also check if the parents of the patients would have this gain or loss of genetic material. So over a time period of um, six to seven years, we analyzed um, in some a mixed cohort of non-syndromic or isolated and syndromic RM patients. Um, we would classify syndromic patients according to the case classification guidelines um, described by Rasmus Nadal in 2003, um, where he said, basically that a person, for example, with a chromosomal anomaly, with a neurocognitive impairment, with a um, metabolic disease co-occurring is um, definitely not an isolated case. And, um, but a person with an anorectal malformation and a sacral, um, small sacral dysplasia mm -hmm like the oscotigus is missing or an renal anomaly, we would consider a non-syndromic case because here um, the same developmental field is affected, but no other developmental field. And interestingly, in the first small study, we found a de novo duplication that is quite large. Here you can see the duplication um, here where you see a gain of the intensity and the person had nothing but an anorectal malformation even though many uh, base pairs were involved a large region of the uh, chromosome 18. and then um, and this we published together with the group of carlo and um, iris um, from nijmegen and evo um, we described two patients with the novo 13 q deletions and um, the deletions were quite large, and here the patients would show the complete picture of the artifactal association. And the completions were of different uh, deletions were of different size. Uh, the phenotype was the same, so we thought there might be a phenocritical region that you can see here. Um, however, we could not pinpoint a um, specific gene that might be responsible. So interestingly. After all these studies, we found um, de novo CNVs um, in only 5% of all patients. And 11 of these 12 patients in which we detected uh, de novo CNVs were syndromic. So we assume from our data um, to 2017 that large alterations are likely to cause syndromic ARM and that overall such large alterations do not play a major role in the genetics of ARM. Um, right now we have a study in revision. Um, it contained 450 ARM patients compared to 4,392 healthy controls. Um, we assume this is probably the largest CNV study um, that has been out there. And um, we found here uh, four microscopic chromosomal anomalies that would be, have been visible in micro, uh, chromosomal studies only. We found seven micro deletions and two micro duplications that were only present in the patients and that were unique um, compared to uh, public databases. And this again showed, uh, gives us a figure of 3%, basically 
replicating our findings from 2011 to 2017 that CNVs might not play a major role in the expression of human ARN. Within these CNVs, we suggest uh, three candidate genes that had been previously reported in animal models or humans with ARM. It's FOXK2, LPP, and SAL3. And further studies are warranted um, with like resequencing in the complete cohort of these genes to see if they really contribute to human ARM. There has been one other large study by a Chinese group published in 2013 in Human Molecular Genetics. And they describe um, uh, enrichment of rare CNVs. However, in their study, they only found also one de novo CNV comprising DKK4, and all other CNVs were not de novo. And it is still speculative um, based on the data back then if these rare CNVs contribute and how they contribute to the expression of ARM. So it could very well be that they increase the risk, but it could also very well be that if we repeat the study today and compare it to all the CNVs known today, that the p-value is not that, that low anymore. So we think again CNVs are not an important key player. So from the data together with the, uh, our colleagues from Nijmegen and the Netherlands, we performed a genome-wide association study. And this was basically done by um, Gabriel and by Iris. And um, the calculations were done by um, Carlo May. And um, they looked at all non-centromic isolated patients comparing to um, healthy controls and the cohort comprised almost 800 patients and they could not find any genome-wide significant region. Then they looked only at perineal fistula of non-centromic patients comparing this subgroup to a healthy controls and again, they could not find any genome-wide significant finding. And this puzzled us because um, when we look at the chivas that we previously did for bladder extrophy or just recently published esophageal atresia, with um, less patients, we would find um, several genome-wide significant regions in both phenotypes. So, um, Right now, we cannot explain why the uh, multifactorial genetic predisposition in anorectal malformations is not visible through Chivas analysis. And maybe there is not such a uh, multifactorial genetic predisposition, or it is not very high, um, and we need much larger cohorts. However, um, if there is such a missing heritability, um, I want to go back to the study that Carlo just mentioned. And um, this leaves us with another puzzle because it could very well be that the data um, that we published is biased. But um, when we did this analysis, um, we were sitting in a meeting and we were discussing and said it might be interesting to see how many of the families that we included in QRNet actually um, had affected children. So affected persons with ARM also have affected children. Then we look, went back into our database and we looked at all adults with anorectal malformations who had fathered or who had children. And then we looked how many of these children were affected. And it could be that during the process of collecting these families, um, these families volunteered more than other families. However, we collected a lot of um, adult patients with anorectal malformations. Um, and most of them would not have children yet. But those who had children, an impressive number of children were also affected. 
So this again would suggest that there is a very strong impact, genetic impact. So maybe we have to apply systematic exome analysis. This is a paper that we brought out on cloacal extropy. This was our index family here. Um, and we found a de novo variant in SLC20A1. Then we resequenced our extropy cohort, found another de novo variant, uh, not previously published in this family. And then we found a very rare inherited variant in this in this um, boy with classic bladder extrophy, but it was inherited from the mother. But when the mother was examined by the um, Dutch urologist, they found um, dye spaces of the synthesis with this uh, minor um, phenotypic feature of bladder extrophy, and then. By further genetic analysis, we uh, were able to show that the grandparents would not carry the variant. So the de novo event is in this generation passed on to this generation. And then with the help of um, our collaborators in Manchester, uh, we were able to show, um, the work was done by Adrian Wolf and um, by um, William Newman's group that in the um, urogenital sinus here, the protein is expressed very early in human development. And then my student did a very nice work. She looked at zebrafish. So this is our vertebrate model system. And here in the zebrafish, um, on day three to five, the cloaca opens up. And in at this time, the gastrointestinal tract here and the urogenital tract open up similar, uh, simultaneously into the cloaca. And so if this here does not open, you should actually see a backup of the um, intestinal fluid. And um, that's what she did here. She gave the fish who starts eating at day 4.5, the larvae, she gave um, a, a dye, sulfuronamide, which is ingested and passed out again um, without being taken up. And in this wild type fish, the uh, dye is um, just passed out through the gastrointestinal opening in the cloaca. In the morpholino knockdown fish, it cannot be passed. And you see a reduced peristalsis. Here you can see the backup and you can see a missing opening in the Morpholino knockdown. And this was uh, replicated to the stage of significance. So we think that what we found in the initial girl with cloacal extrophy, who also has a high anorectal agenesis, that this gene is involved in hindgut formation. This study is not published. This was an initial family with fatafactal association that I collected myself. Um, the uncle has the full fatafactal association with four um, phenotypic features, including anorectal malformations, and so has his niece. And the mother in between is healthy. So we thought that this it's difficult to solve, but then we were thinking about maybe there is skewed X inactivation so that the X chromosome in the daughter here with uh, possibly carrying a disease causing variant is over um, active compared to the other um, X chromosome um, that comes from the father. And we look for skewed X inactivation and indeed the X chromosome coming from the mother was uh, active in over 80% of all cells. So we did exome sequencing and we found a very, very rare variant in shroom four. And then we um, did put shroom four, we put it into gene matcher and found this family here. And the person has a um, urorectal malformation and further anomalies. And we found these um, three male patients who have a deletion um, of room 4 and dent and um, in their phenotypic feature that um, is, uh, is uh, basically belongs to the urectal malformation system they all three have 
posterior urethral valves. So we did again fish studies and we were able to show that um, the shroom for knockdown morpholino has a very often pericardial edema, which might, just a hypothesis, might show the involvement of the heart um, or might reflect the cardiac phenotype in our factor patients. And we were able to show that the pronephros of the fish is affected in the knockdown morpholino here by dilatation of the um, pronephric duct um, to a significant matter in the morpholino knockdown compared to the wild type and the rescue um, of the morpholino with wild type human RNA. And again, when we looked at the anorectal tract, we could basically replicate our previously findings, our previous findings of the SLC20A1 knockdown. Also here um, in the control, the uh, dye is passed easily, but in the knockdown it's not, and it's a backup and the gastrointestinal opening is, uh, the gastrointestinal tract does not open in the cloaca. And um, this work is currently in process of submission. So in conclusion, um, we think that the genetic um, studies we have done so far do not completely or only in parts reflect the epidemiological findings that we see. Um, and we have to try to get funding, which is not so easy and continue our systematic research um, because we believe that only because we haven't found um, the genetic causes that the, um, there are genetic causes and we might have to look in more depth um, with exome analysis and um, apply this systematically to all patients and we might also have to look on the non-coding regions um, in the future. I want to thank all the people at the lab, um, the students who made all of this possible, Eckehart, um, who has been the most greatest support over the past 12 years, establishing the QNet re register in Germany and um, supporting the ARMnet register. Benjamin um, with the Zebrafish Core facility and Philip who um, helped us with uh, mouse models and uh, mouse stainings. And of course, um, we want to thank all the clinicians out there who have been sampling so brave over the past years and supported us. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you very much, both for you, for the uh, wonderful talk. Um, maybe uh, Carlo can also share his webcam so we can see you both. Um, for the attendees, please type in your questions in the question field, and um, we have now some time to answer them. Um, I did already have one question. I sent it to you, uh, Carla, that you received. You are muted, Carla. No, yeah, I, I can. Uh, yeah, great. Yeah, I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't unmute myself. So the question uh, I see is, please, how to explain a family history of constipation and risk of anorectal malformation? Now, uh, in in, in um, some families we have seen, uh, a diagnosis of ARM was made in a patient, and when we look at the families. Uh, other family members, they already complained about constipation. And uh, when you carefully investigated them, it was not just regular uh, constipation, but it was uh, uh, an anal stenosis, or uh, so a, a minor form of an anorectal malformation. 
so that's why I think it's important to ask for constipation because this could be well be an undiscovered minor anorectal malformation. Does that, an does that answer the question? Okay, thank you. I think it does. Um, please, uh, everyone, type in your questions because it's the last few minutes. In the meanwhile, uh, I would like to tell you that the webinar has been recorded and will be available on uh, GoToWebinar and on our YouTube channel. Uh, and the links will be sent tomorrow. All links for previous sessions are on our website, um, as are the details of the forthcoming webinars. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, where you can easily find past webinars. Uh, finally, uh, all of you who have attended today will receive a survey immediately after the session. And we would be very grateful if you could spend a few minutes filling it in uh, to help us continuously improve further sessions. Um, for now, I have no other uh, questions. And I think it's about 7 o'clock. So thank you very much for your uh, very interesting talk and everyone at home, thank you for attending and have a very nice evening.